timer objects are used to trigger an event at specified intervals. I have here a dynamic text box named display underscore txt. currently has a number 1 in it. And let me just run this. When I click the start button, every second it's going to add 1 to this number and display it. And I can stop it and I can resume it. So let's take a look at how a timer is used to accomplish this. I have a button named start underscore btn and stop underscore btn. My text box was named display underscore txt. And then here's my code. So I have a variable called xyz. It's a class level or global variable. I set the value equal to 1. It's an integer variable. And then I'm creating a timer object, an instance of the timer class. And you'll see that the class is imported here along with a timer event class. So I'm creating a new timer called my timer, and then in parentheses I'm specifying a thousand. That is the number of milliseconds. So every thousand milliseconds, which is equivalent to one second, the timer is going to be triggered. Then I add an event listener to my timer that is responding to a timer event dot timer. This is that every 1000 milliseconds this timer event triggers and it's going to call a method called increment number. And then here's the function that is called. Increment number. I'm going to increment XYZ by 1 and display that in my text box. That's what happens every second. It doesn't do that until the timer is started. And so you'll see I have two more event listeners here for the two different buttons, start underscore btn and stop underscore btn. And I simply chose to, in both cases, call the same function. Start stop timer is the name of my function. Here's the function. I simply use a switch statement to look at what button was clicked. And I'm getting taking the e variable from the mouse event trigger looking at the target, the button that was clicked, and getting its name, putting that into a variable called btn. And if btn is start underscore btn, then I'm going to start the timer. I call the start method of my timer. If I clicked the stop underscore btn button, then I'm going to call the stop method of my timer. Let me execute this again now that you've seen the code. So notice nothing happens until I click the start button, which is starting that timer. And then every 1000 milliseconds, the number is being incremented and the stop button sends a stop method to that timer control or a timer object. And it stops. And if I click start again, it will resume again every second. You'll notice one other thing happening here, and that is I've got a clock down here that's running. This is a little movie clip that also uses a timer. So let's take a look at that code. So here's my movie clip down here in the bottom. I'm going to double click on it to burrow into it. So now I'm looking at MC Clock. It has a dynamic text box called time underscore txt and another one called date underscore txt. And it also has an actions layer of its own. Let's take a look at the actions. So first of all, I have a, an array called months which I've initialized for 12 strings of January, February, March, April, and so forth. I'm creating a timer instance called clock, and I'm going to trigger this every half second, 500 milliseconds, just ensures that the clock is updated you know, at least once a second. Um, as the clock is updated, if, it's, if there's no change, then we won't see anything happen in the text boxes. So I add an event listener to that that's going to call update clock, and then I start my clock. Here's my function that updates the clock. I'm taking a date variable called now, and then for my date underscore txt text box, I'm going to set the text to whatever now.month is, and that starts counting with zero. So January is zero, February is one. So if it's January, now.month is going to be zero. I'm going to get the zero element of months, and that's going to be the word January. I'm going to concatenate a space to it, 
and then use now.date. That's going to be the day 1 through 31. Um, convert that to a string. I'm going to add a comma and a space, and then I'm going to get the full year and convert that to a string. Placing all that in my date underscore txt text box. That displays the date. Now that's not going to update, but once a day. Then the timer, I'm getting using now and getting the number of hours. And I've got a method here called get hour. And I'm passing it that now.hours, which is and in get hours is receiving an integer variable, which I've called XYZ. So hours is an integer from 0 to 23. And then I'm simply setting if it's looking at the value of XYZ, the current hour is set to 0. But if XYZ equals 0, meaning it's right after midnight, I'm going to set the current hour to 12. Otherwise, if XYZ is greater than 12, because we're working with a 24 hour clock, I'm going to subtract 12 from XYZ. So if XYZ was 13, then current hour is going to be 1. Then if current hour is greater than 9, so if it's 10, 11, or 12, I'm going to return the current hour. If it's 9 or less, I want to return a 0 with the current hour. So it's a two-digit hour that I'm returning. Then back in my statement here of, of concatenating this text, I'm going to concatenate a colon. And then I'm going to take now.minutes, that's going to be a value between 0 and 60, and I'm going to call a function called format2 and pass that minutes value. And format2 simply takes that integer value, and if it's less than 10, adds a 0 in front of it. Otherwise, it returns the number back as a string. So I don't need to convert that to a string. It's being sent back as a string, as was the get hour. Notice there's no to string there. The to string occurs in the return statement. I'm going to concatenate another colon. And then I'm going to do the same thing with seconds. Call that same function format2. So if it's less than 10, I'm going to put a 0 in front of it. And then a space. And then I've got another function I wrote here called get ampm. I'm going to pass it the hours. And get ampm simply looks at that value of the hours. And if it's less than 12, it returns an am. Otherwise, it's going to return a p.m. So 0 through 11 is a.m. 12 through 23 is p.m., 24-hour clock. And the result then, if I go back and run this, is there's my time. So the hours, two digits, minutes, seconds, and a.m. p.m. It's being updated every half second, but we really see it happen every second. And when it hits the stroke of midnight, we would see our date change. Now in the library, I have created a movie clip called MC Stopwatch. I'm just going to drag that instance of that over here. And this is a standalone movie clip that utilizes a timer control. And actually, I'm going to delete that for a minute. I want to go back to my scene. I want to put it right on the main timeline here. Oops. So I'm going to drag an instance over. And I'm going to burrow down into it so we can look at the code for this. So basically I have a text box here named minsec, M-I-N-S-E-C underscore T-X-T. And then I want a little smaller text for the hundredths of a second. And this is called hundredths underscore T-X-T. I've got a button here called start stop. So I use the same button to start the timer, same button to stop the timer, as opposed to over here where we used two buttons. This button will we'll simply use an if statement if the timer's running. Uh, we'll stop it. If it's not running, we'll start it. And then this button here, uh, reset underscore BTN, simply clears the values. Let's take a look at the code. So again, I'm importing a timer class and a timer event class. There's also this utilities. Uh, class called get timer. It's flash.utils.getTimer. And here's my timer object. I just called it my timer. I'm going to get a new timer. And I'm going to update this every five milliseconds. That means 200 times a second. When the timer is running, I'm going to trigger the event. I'm going to set a variable called start time to zero and elapse time to zero. And here's my reset button going to call it a method called reset. I'm sending a stop method to my timer. So if it's running, it's going to stop. 
I'm going to reset these two variables of start timer and elapsed time, and I'm simply going to redisplay the text as zero. That start stop button. We're going to call a method called start stop. There's that function. If my timer dot running running is a property of the timer object, so my timer dot running returns a value either true or false. If it's true, I'm going to send a stop command. Otherwise, I'm going to send a start command. When I send that start command, I'm going to set start time to this function called get timer. This is a method that gets the milliseconds since the player started. So once I start my application, this is going to increase by 1,000 every second. And then here is the event listener for my timer. I'm calling a function called display elapsed. And I'm simply going to get, again, the current time, subtract the start time, and that's the number of milliseconds that has passed since the time I started the timer to now. And then I'm going to divide the elapsed time by 60,000. That's going to give me the number of minutes. I'm going to divide it by 1,000, which will give me the number of seconds. And then if seconds is greater than 59, I'm going to take the seconds and subtract the number of minutes times 60. So I'm getting rid of all the extra minutes and reducing that down just to the last within the last 60 seconds. I'm also going to set a variable called hundredths to the elapsed time. And here I'm going to use the modulus operator of 1,000. And I'm going to divide by 10 to give me hundredths. So going from milliseconds to hundredths. Minsec underscore txt dot text. I'm going to take mins, call that format to method again. So I'm getting a zero if it's less than nine. Same thing with the seconds. I want two digits. And then the hundredths, I'm going to format, use format to method again and send it the hundredths. And here's that format to method that we saw earlier in the main timeline. I'm simply using it here in the movie clip. So this movie clip is self-standing. So I can then use this stopwatch in any other application. Let me just run this. So I'm going to start it and stop. And if I start it again, it's going to start back at zero. And if I click the reset button, it also sets it back to zero. So when creating a game, you could have a countdown timer. Maybe it goes from 60 seconds down to zero. Rather than incrementing, you might have that timer decrement. And when it gets zero, maybe have an if statement that would say your time's up or go to another frame where it says your time is up. So that's how we might use a timer in creating a game.